Hello, everybody, and welcome to the TeacherCast Educational Broadcasting Network, your home for professional development. My name is Jeff Bradbury, and thank you so much for joining us today. We have a great show for you. Today, we're talking all about STEM education and some of the great things that you can do. We have a great company on named Tinker, and we're going to be talking to Dan Rizak from Tinker to talk all about STEM education and what you guys can be doing in your classrooms. We, of course, want to hear from you and all the great things that are happening in your neck of the woods. You can find us on Twitter at TeacherCast. Leave us a voice message over at TeacherCast.net slash voicemail email us at feedback at teachercast.net and of course subscribe to this and all of our shows over on teachercast.net slash audio and teachercast.net slash video one more time thank you guys for being here i hope you're having a great time in this part of the school year my guest today has a great program that i'm happy to share with you guys today i want to bring on from the tinker corporation mr daniel rezak dan how are you today welcome to teachercast uh very good man thank you very much for having me on today Thank you so much. How are you today? You are a former educator. Is that correct? Oh, I would like to say I'm always an educator, you know. Um, but uh, yes, uh, so because I'm always learning, always growing, you know, um, it's, it's all in the, the way you look at things. But yes, I'm the uh, education community manager uh, at Tinker. And, and what is Tinker? I know that I, I've heard a lot about it. I see you guys all over the place on your social medias. Tell us what is Tinker? Yeah, Tinker is a coding platform for kids. Um, you know, basically start start them in kindergarten as, as young as they can go, uh, all the way to uh, oh, maybe eighth grade, ninth grade. Um, and we are pretty much the number one platform uh, on Hour of Code. So if you've ever done Hour of Code, you most likely have played a Tinker, uh, one of our Tinker puzzles or one of our uh, interactives there. I love the Hour of Code. It is certainly one of those resources that I share with all of my teachers as we go through here. Tell us a little bit about what we can expect. The website, of course, is tinker.com, T-Y-N-K-E-R.com. Um, is this something that a teacher signs up for or do they have to have an account? How does, how does the website, how does the program work? Yeah, absolutely. Well, it's free for anyone. You know, uh, right now, if you're a teacher and you want to go and start uh, teaching your kids uh, computer science with Tinker, uh, go right now, go to tinker.com slash join. And you can upload students. You can kind of see what the dashboard look, lo looks like. There's free lessons uh, already. You can go and just uh, and dive in and assign those to your students. Um, and if you've done, like I said, Hour of Code stuff, these will probably be familiar to you. So they'll build on those skills. Um, and those uh, those free lessons will vary from you know, from your, uh, you know, very young students to middle school. And I understand correctly that there's been more than 60,000 schools that have been uh, working with you guys and, and, and enjoying the Tinker products. Oh, absolutely. Right now, uh, more than 60,000 schools. I believe we hit 50 million students, which is a pretty big number. Uh, you know, just uh, we're really hitting a nerve right now with uh, with schools in um with computer science initiatives, there's a couple states right now that are that are really taking it upon themselves to make computer science mandatory, and uh, Virginia is one of those. Uh, Florida is another, and I know that there's more that are that are talking about it, um, uh, that uh, that see these skills as uh, um, essential skills for uh, for getting a job and and being successful in a, in the modern workplace. So. You know, and, and as you said, it's becoming more and more common where computer science education is just part of this. You know, Google recently launched a computer science curriculum called, I believe it's called CS First. Mm -hmm. and, and of course, we have Hour of Code. Microsoft's getting involved with their computer science curriculum. Is there a difference between STEM and coding and programming? And I know we're talking about being makers. Is this all under one big, huge umbrella or should we be looking at this as different courses or different pathways for our students? Yeah, and I think when you when you're talking programming and you're talking computer science, there are elements of engineering involved that uh, that go beyond uh, just text coding. Uh, so you know, there's um, you know other scaffolding and structure that 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 goes along with that. So I think when we're talking about coding, we're talking about you know we're talking about uh, the that task of, of of writing that language of technology, uh, which you know it can manifest itself in JavaScript and Python and Swift languages, uh, and, or in universal language of Tinker code, uh, Tinker block coding. You know, I talked a lot to my teachers who are doing 
coding and, and computer science and programming and stuff like that. And they're always asking me, where can I go to learn more? You know, do I have to go to a faraway camp? Can I learn something in my house? Is this expensive? Tinker has come up with a pretty neat solution here called the Blue Ribbon Educator Program. Dan, can you tell us a little bit about what this is and how we can get involved in it? Yeah, absolutely. Um, in fact, we, we just launched the Blue Ribbon Educator Program um, a couple of weeks ago. And so you can go to tinker.com and just check this link because I know we just updated it. Uh, tinker.com slash blue ribbon. Uh, and it will take you to an application. Uh, and basically what the Blue Ribbons are, the Tinker Blue Ribbon uh, Educator Program, is it's a, it's a community. You know, it's a community, and we're, our, our goal is to train the educator of the future, you know, basically to, to train that next generation of educators who are ready to uh, take on the task of, of, of uh, you know, working with their students to give them those necessary skills. Uh, and so, you know, we're going to offer an opportunity for them to to get trained by tinker and coding uh, masters. Uh, and then it go, it's an ongoing program. So we, you know, we're connected conferences. We give them opportunities for uh, for presenting at other conferences um, and being a part of the greater coding community. And is this a, a one year community or is this something that you see that if, after you go through the first cohort, you're now in with the program and you get this continued support year after year? Definitely, definitely. Once you're a Blue en uh, Ribbon Educator, uh, you know, we, we expect that our, our, our community is just going to continue to grow and that those people are going to find, uh, and educators are going to find such value in uh, the resources that we're giving them, in, you know, because we're giving them, you know, we're giving them access to all, you know, all of our curricula, uh, you know, and, uh, you know, some early access to tools and stuff like that, 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 that arise. Um, and they're going to find that valuable and they're going to want to share it with their kids. And uh, so, yeah, they're, they're, you know, it's going to, it's just going to continue to grow. And who do you see as the ideal person to apply to this? Is this the computer science teacher or is this the media center teacher? Or could this be just the anybody who wants to even get their feet wet into computer science? Who do you see applying for a position like this? Yeah, good question. You know, I think it's if you if you're familiar with any of these kind of a programs uh, like, you know, ambassador quote ambassador programs, uh, you know, we don't. Uh, we're not looking at this as an ambassador program per se. Uh, we're looking at this as a, as a community. And a lot of the thing about computer science, you know, is there's a lot of teachers that I I know and because I've talked with them that have always wanted to learn these skills, and they also know how important it is for them their students to have these skills. But they've always been kind of on the fence about diving in. You know, maybe they played around with Scratch over the past, you know, over the years. Maybe they played a little around with some of these, you know, online, you know, coding programs and whatnot, like Mozilla's Thimble and some of these other ones. Um, but they've been kind of waiting, waiting for the right opportunity and waiting for a community to invite them in uh, where they could learn these skills and get a leg up and then share those uh, skills with their with their students. So um, I'm kind of, you know, there's, of course, there's going to be educators that are, that apply for this that are going to have experience with Tinker and Scratch and a lot of these other program uh, programs. But um, we're also looking for those that are just really dedicated mm -hmm. to making this uh, important in their teaching practice. So, um, so you don't have to be an expert. No previous uh, Tinker experience is required personally. Um, so, yeah. You know, I think a lot of the teachers are looking at computer science these days and saying, well, I'm a fourth grade teacher. That's computer science. We don't go together. I, I think a lot of teachers aren't quite sure yet how to bring computer science into their already existing fourth grade curriculum. What advice do you give anybody out there who might want to try this but doesn't quite know how to do explorers and sailors and the you know all those different topics but bring coding into that? Yeah, you know, that's a very good question. And I will tell you, I had that same struggle uh, working in a middle school and a, in an elementary school. Um, I've been a tech coach and a tech integrator, tech director, and this maker coordinator, maker lab coordinator and STEM coordinator. And so one of my struggles over the years, uh, even with starting with Scratch, has been how do I bring this out of my lab situation or how do I bring this out of just our technology STEM, you know, 
corridor and bring it into the classroom. Uh, and with if you're using Scratch, that's really challenging, you know. And I any teacher I talk to that has has used Scratch, if I say, okay, can you just hand Scratch to a fourth grade classroom teacher and say, you know, integrate and and good luck, and they all say no. You could you couldn't really do that. Um, and with Tinker is much different because the way that our lessons are scaffolded, the way that our our um, our tool is, is you know put together is very kid friendly. Um, but we also have an entire library of uh, STEM connections. I think we call them STEM lessons, but I like to use the word core curriculum integration. You know, it's a it's a more friendly word, and it's kind of I think driven towards the goal, which is to get these tools into the sci the science class and the social studies uh, class, sorry, and uh, math and English. We want to see kids not just learn coding, but we want them to be able to apply it. And I'm, I was honestly, for the last 10 years, I've been looking for something that would make it, uh, that would give me those opportunities as an, as an educator to, to go up to my social studies teacher and say, Hey, you know, our kids have been learning this. Can they apply it in social studies? That's all I want to be able to ask and say. And if you've ever been a you know a tech integrator or a coach or director, you know that sometimes you get the answer you know from your teachers like, I've got a million things. I've got to hit these standards. I've got to do this. And and you know there's sometimes an expectation that it's going to be really hard to do that. And uh, I just found with Tinker that it wasn't that I was I was starting to have that conversation with my my teachers, and it was starting to go that way. That oh wait, this isn't that this isn't as hard as I thought it would be. And so teachers were starting to take our STEM lessons and uh, put them into their practice, not being masters, not being, you know, super tech savvy, uh, but still being able to say, hey, I can do this. Uh, and I, I just thought that that was remarkably different than, than anything I've ever seen. And that's one of those things that I like about the applications like Tinker, like Scratch, like all those hour of code applications is you don't really have to look at it as the hour of code. You can dive into this and then realize, oh, I'm just teaching linear thinking. I'm just teaching, you know, following directions, all these different coding skills that really are the basis for what we're talking about. You know, I take those, I bring those into kindergarten and say, look, if the kid can make the Star Wars character go up, turn to the left, go up, turn to the right, go up, then we can start to get him to ask questions. And then that's the same kinds of concepts as how do I go to the bathroom? Well, you stand up, you push your chair in, you go, you open the door, you do your thing. You, you know, it's just following directions and, and learning how to do this sequence. One of the things that I love about Tinker is not only are you dedicated to helping students learn, but you have a great blog post, I want to pull it up here, on trying to close the gender gap and helping to not you know, push this on boys, but also on girls. And of course, you know, we're sitting here trying to encourage school districts to help close the gender gap. We just did a show a few weeks ago with Microsoft Education where we were working on their Make What's Next campaign. And, yep. and, and it's really, really nice to see that Tinker is trying to help the world bridge that gender gap. Oh my God. It's just, it's an opportunity that you can't ignore. You know, I have a 12 year old daughter myself. So, you know, I certainly, I want her to be empowered by, you know, the future is now, right now, you know, uh, we are automation, all these things we talk about are happening right now when it comes to, uh, you know, we're losing jobs to automation in the next three years, I think we're going to lose 5 million jobs to automation. In the next 10 years, I think that there's something like 40% of middle management jobs are, are going to be gone. Uh, I mean, this is happening now. We can't, you know, we have to empower our students, you know, males and females uh, to get them and give them these skills because they're going to get out of, you know, 12 years old. She's going to graduate college before I know it. And, you know, I want her to be prepared. I, I want her to be ready uh, and have have these STEM skills. It's just going to just going to need it. And do you see a lot with, you know, the, the school districts that you inter interact with? you know, STEM, it's science, technology, and engineering, and math. And it seems like so many times school districts say, well, STEM is the science teacher's responsibility. And, mm -hmm. you know, the math teacher kind of gets pulled along with it, or we don't really have an engineering department, but, you know, again, it's the science teacher. 
what advice do you have for school districts or what advice are you giving school districts to really take all of those content supervisors, put them in a room and say, no, these these kids, this concept is everybody's responsibility, as you said, moving forward towards graduation. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I you know, I I've said a little bit already, but I mean, one of, uh, you know, certainly highlighting the idea that you know, we need to prepare our kids for this, but I think there's a problem with the word STEM. And I think if you talk to anybody who's, you know, a STEM teacher, they'll tell you the same thing. And that's the, honestly, from a budget point of view, you know, I, I, I look at it from in, in, in a kind of this scenario and you have a, you have a STEM teacher and then you have your math teacher sitting in a, uh, you know, it, in a room with the principal and the math teacher says he needs more money for textbooks. And the STEM teacher says he needs to buy some raspberry pies. Um, and who is going to get the first dibs, uh, if they only have a certain amount of money left. Right. Now it's of course it's going to be the math teacher. Right. Uh, and I think we need to be at a point where we see those two on an equal footing because they are both, you know, the, the coding part of things, is only going to help improve math scores. It's only going to help improve, you know, all of those scores across the board. You know, having someone, having a student know some of these seeds we're planting with Tinker in the earliest of age, you know, of grades, kindergarten, first grade. You know, we're talking about conditional statements. We're talking about, you know, that's geometry stuff that you don't learn till high school. Um, having that stuff planted that early is not a bad thing, not at all, right? Um, so I always try to make sure that they see, uh, at least when it comes to coding, uh, and tinker that, you know, we are planting these seeds so early, it's going to have an impact on all of your other, uh, on all of your other domains, so your math, your science, your social studies. Um, and the other thing too, is if you look at it as you, as if you're teaching a language and this is the thing. And I think the way that uh, Tinker really treats coding um, and I, a way that I totally believe as well. If you look as, at coding as like what I've asked before in other, other places, you know, what is the, um, what is the language of technology? Um, and in, in many ways, coding really is the language of technology at, at its bare essence. And so if you're, if you want to get a student and you want to, you know, work with them on the language of technology, you need to start at the earliest of age and teaching them how to code. Uh, and that's, you know, cause if you're going to be fluent in any language, whether it's French, ling you know, in uh, English uh, or Spanish or anything like that, you want to start in the very earliest of age. And so uh, if you look at things a little bit differently, you know, think differently. Now, if you look at things that way, uh, you're going to always have a space for coding. Uh, and maybe we can, maybe we can do without the word STEM and we can start talking about just language. Well, do you, do you yeah. see STEM? I mean, we, we, we hear this over and over again, it's kind of become cliche, but you know, it's not technology if it was created before you were born, right? Like for my three-year-olds that, you know, iPods is not technology. iPods is just there. The internet is just there. It's not really technology for the kids. We are dealing with kids that have been alive, you know, cable modems, Wi-Fi, all this stuff has been alive, has been around since before the kids were born. Do you right. see the day where, as you were saying, we're not calling it STEM. It's just part of education to be bringing in the computer science and the coding and programming and whatnot. Yeah, well, I think you're also, you're seeing a repeat of what we did 25 years or 20 years ago with uh, technology labs, right? So we had uh, technology was very expensive. So we created labs where kids could go down to the lab and they would do a little bit of, you know, you know, hop on a computer and do Oregon Trail and uh, maybe do some Microsoft Word and stuff like that. Um, and then we got personal mobile devices. And so we were able to free up the lab. And so that was great. You know, in the last five, six years, you've seen one-to-one -one programs with iPads and Chromebooks and all this great. So we've, we've freed up the lab. Now we have kind of a, an odd thing happening where I, I don't want to be totally a pessimistic because I, I love the maker movement. Uh, and I, I'm a big fan of making and I'm a maker fair producer and I've you know, done a lot with that. But we're now bringing kids back to the maker lab. 
um, and treating it like an initiative, which you know a lot of people are piloting stuff like that, and that's 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 okay. Um, but now I, we 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 want to start taking that maker lab and and do the same thing we did with our computer labs and start bringing it into the classroom and see these skills being used every day and not just once a week. So we have this pattern, um, and and maybe that's it's time to get out of and for me anyway, <laughs> it's time to get out of the pilot phase for the maker movement and it's time to move that into the classroom. Dan, how do you see that playing out? I mean, it's one thing to look twenty years ago and say, well, now. You, you can't really have a computer lab. Every student needs to have a device, right? Everybody has to have something. In, so they're, they're, look, as much as I have nostalgia for Oregon Trail too, right? You, you can't say we're going to go to the computer lab. But do you really see in five, ten years everybody sitting there with a bunch of little bits at their desk? Um, I don't know that. I mean, I'm sure that there are going to if you're doing industrial making, there's going to be a reason to have a space where you have a huge laser cutter in your school. And, and, and that's OK. Um, maybe just the way that we treat those materials and the opportunity to use those is not like, oh, I only get like 45 minutes once a week to go and try to use this laser cutter or whatever. Um, maybe we, we we schedule things differently. We look at ways to, to make sure that students have um, easier access to those. So if they have an idea, they can act on it fast. Um, and the other thing too is, you know, now we have had, uh, you know, Chromebooks seem to be really taking off, right? I think at one point Chromebooks seem to uh, be doing a little bit better than the iPads uh, over the last year or so. Um, and the one thing to just think about that is that I think Google Apps and a lot of what you get on a Chromebook is is kind of level I want to say leveled off right. where it's time to start thinking about what you can do beyond Google Docs and Google Sheets and Google Slides and to start to think, you know, what what do we do now? Well, let's program. Right. Let's, you know, let's let's hack it away and, and uh, you know, and build something that way. Well, you, you can certainly see that there's a direction going there. I mean, it was last year or two years ago, Apple came out with Swift and even mm -hmm. this year on the Apple Distinguished Educator applications. It's, you know, where's your iBooks? Where's your iTunes? You, but hey, where's your Swift stuff that you're using? And even was it yesterday, Apple just redid their iPad lineup and their lowest iPad is now 349 somewhere in there, which is, you know, it's a decent sized Chromebook that you can get for the same exact price. So it is yeah. interesting to see where education is going to lead and follow because you're right, over the last couple of years, Chromebooks have kind of dominated tablets. Yeah, no, and it, it's a definitely a competitive space, uh, no doubt about it. And and competition is good, you know. Once if we're driving prices down, if we're giving, you're just giving more access to uh, more opportunity to more students. So that that's a good thing. We're here today talking to Dan Rizek from Tinker.com. Of course, you can check them out on Twitter over at Go Tinker. That's G O T Y N K E R dot com. And Dan, you know, I, I know you wanted to do some demos. What kind of things did you want to share with us today? Because I am really excited to learn a little bit more about how this works. Yeah, sure. Uh, well, you know, one of the things I get really excited about is uh, integrating tinker into the core classes. And so I just, I like to always highlight the ways that tinker um, plants the seeds of STEM at, at very early ages. Um, so I have, this is our tinker workshop, uh, it, what you see here, and this is kind of our, you know, our standard development environment for, uh, for kids. Um, but we also have a puzzle environment that uh, you've probably seen if you've done an hour of code. Uh, and this is, uh, it kind of looks like this, and this is a conditional loop exercise. Um, so these are two examples just to, you know, just to kind of throw you in um, real quick. Hopefully there's not a whole lot of audio there. So um, I'll start with this younger exercise because it's kind of like kindergarten, first grade uh, level. And one of the things I like to highlight when I show people this, you know, as you're this this lesson is designed for you to, you know, you have to make the spaceship reach the power cell. And this is about a conditional, uh, you know, conditional loop, basically. And so as we put this together, I, tr I, t I was actually talking with a group of uh, teachers a couple of weeks ago and I was like, hey, so as, as I'm doing this, 
Um, this if then statement, and I, I'm not a math teacher, so I asked this teacher, I'm the, uh, this group of teachers, I'm like, so what is this if then statement? Tell, talk to me about that. What, what is that represented in math? What is that? And one of the math teachers was like, well, you know, I, that's geometry, you know, and it's like a, it's a proof statement. Uh, and, and I was like, well, you know, we're doing this in what first grade kindergarten is, is that okay? You know, like there's, just, there's something wrong with us planting these seeds of, of math at that early in age. And of course, nobody says uh, no. Um, and so I just, you know, it's one of the, it's one of the ways, uh, many ways that we're, we're planting seeds at very early age of, of math concepts that they may not know what, that this is geometry and that's okay. And they might, may not know that this is a high level math concept, but when they get into, you know, seventh and eighth grade and they start doing this, it's going to click for them. Um, one of the other little fun things too, is that we just added this option on some of our, our puzzles and our puzzles, uh, where you can now toggle between, uh, Tinker, JavaScript and Python. Uh, do you see that? That looks really, really neat actually. So we're always trying to make the connection between, you know, these are universal Tinker blocks, but they, they also translate to JavaScript. They translate to Python. Um, and a, a young, you know, a first grader is not going to know what that means. And that's okay. What we've done is we've ignited inquiry. You know, we've, 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 kids are going to ask questions. And they're going to start saying, hey, you know, what does this do? What, what, I don't understand what JavaScript is. And that's exactly what you want them to do. Like when you have them asking those kind of questions, you've got them, right? Um, and so I can actually just play through that and uh, you can watch him reach his uh, power cell. Uh, but this is just kind of like the fun, playful nature of our earlier puzzles. They, um, you know, they're designed to be self-guided. So if a, after a student reaches the end of one level, uh, they get some stars and they're asked to go on to the next one. And the reason that's cool is because it, it, it changes the dynamic in the classroom. You know, if you've ever taught with Scratch or you've taught with some of these other programs, I know because I've had to force feed, you know, computer science information to students. And that's really hard. You know, that's, that's, that is a, that's a, that's a lot of work. Um, this doesn't do that. This basically ignites them they kind of work through things and they start learning the you know the terminology themselves and if they have a question they're gonna raise their hand and that's what you want because now you're going to be working on things authentically with them um one of the other little uh there's a couple little other examples but one of the other ones i like to show is just this is one of our um animation lessons you know and and i think if you're familiar with uh scratch or something like that you're probably familiar with you, you have to be familiar with x y coordinate if you're going to use um you know if you're going to use tinker and so i like to just kind of point that out because you know you've got very young kids who are going to start asking questions like what do these numbers mean what are these lines and what is this x i don't understand uh, and i've been there because i've been in class where they do this very thing and that is inquiry at its best. You want them to ask you, like, how often do you ask, do you ever hear kids saying, can you please teach me and tell me about X, Y coordinates? I really want to know this. Um, so it's just a really, you know, just one of those simple uh, embedded examples of how we're planting those seeds. And then, of course, if you want things to work, you're going to want, like, let's say in this case, you want the fish to move. Um, your, your students are going to start asking you questions about angles and degrees, uh, you know, some basic, basic things that we consider basic math, but a third grader is going to, you know, not going to think that. Uh, and that's, that's inquiry right there. Uh, that's, that's what you want. The other one of the fun little things I like to point out is just, uh, you know, we have these cool physics blocks um, and you've, we have this, this is a game called, uh, what, uh, break some sort of, I don't remember the name of this game. Um, but it's, uh, you know, it kind of is reminiscent of an Angry Birds type of game. Um, and if you look in our blocks, as you start looking up all these different blocks, um, you're going to find the physics blocks. And again, here's another opportunity. I was working with a group a couple months ago, and they were trying to get, they were trying to create the bottle flip game. Are you familiar with the bottle flip game? You know, I've seen seventh graders love this thing, and I've seen bottles explode in hallways. So, yeah, I like the bottle if, theme. If you just Google it, you'll see a lot of video. You know, there's an original video. In fact, I think I talked 
with somebody who was the original school that that where that that video came from but some kids have tried recreating the bottle flip game in tinker and to do that you really should use the physics blocks uh, and i'm just going to use this area just as an example but when you start getting kids moving in that direction and saying okay i want my game to work this way and i want things to fall naturally and i want this you're going to have to uh, turn them on to to their physics blocks and the reason that's uh, important is because now they're going to do the same thing they did in when they were asking you about x y coordinates when they're asking you about conditional loops they're going to start asking you what is force what is impulse what is torque these are terms i'm not you know familiar with but that is inquiry and kids are super motivated when they're using tinker because they want to make stuff work right they want to whether it's a game it doesn't have to be a game you know this is an example of um this is an example of a presentation and it's a self-playing presentation. One of my students did uh, a few months ago uh, about Frederick Douglass. So another example, this is not just about game making. It's about movie making. It's about storytelling. It's about, you know, uh, it's about slideshows, timelines. And Dan, is all of this so, available on your desktop, Chromebooks? Like what, what platforms are optimal for, for using Tinker? Uh, well, all of the curriculum stuff, if you want to dive into the curriculum, uh, like kind of like I am now, that's going to be on a desktop computer. Uh, so Chromebooks, you know, MacBook Airs, whatever you need uh, there. But definitely, you know, I would recommend using Chrome. Um, but, uh, you know, Chromebooks are great. Your iPads, uh, if you want to start doing stuff like flying your drones and connecting to your um, your maker, uh, you know, robots and stuff like that, like your Lego WeDo's, which we now connect to, uh, you're going to use the iPad app for that. Um, I'm just thumbing through our STEM lessons here because there's hundreds, literally hundreds of opportunities for you, whether, you know, as a classroom teacher or a technology, you know, coordinator, coach integrator person to have that conversation with your teachers you know when your science teacher is doing stuff about the brain or you know i'm just thumbing through these but there's so many uh when it comes to stem these are actually what really got me excited about tinker in the first place when i started looking at these stem lessons um but hey let me stop sharing my screen here for a moment um yeah, when I first started looking through the entire Tinker curriculum is when I start, it all started clicking for me because I started seeing that we had this huge array of STEM lessons and now we've got like over a couple hundred. You know? So if you had a social studies teacher who was doing a lesson about ancient civilizations, well, dang, there we, we've got a template you can use in that lesson ready to go for you. Um, and just name name the you know the unit and we've we've got something and that was really key for me here's a drone so if you're using the ipad uh, uh app you're going to want uh to get a parrot drone and we connect with all the parrot drones and sphero and and the lego we do's uh through the ipad app so that's pretty impressive dan i want to say yeah. so much thank you for sharing all that with us for anybody that's out there looking to figure out where they can go or what they can do to learn more about the great things that are happening at Tinker. One more time, talk to us about that professional development opportunity. Yeah, go to tinker.com slash blue ribbon. Uh, and right now applications are open until April 20th. So you have a little bit of time, but uh, if you go to another thing you should check out uh, because it's really awesome. Uh, part of the whole blue ribbon mission uh, is to make computer science a reality for everyone. I mean, that's it. Uh, and the the theme behind this is to go beyond an hour of code. You know, I'm personally, I want to start seeing these things happen every day, every day. Uh, but in order to do that, we, we kind of have to make this more than just an, an hour, more than just a week. It's got to be an everyday activity. So if you go to search the hashtag beyond one hour, um, just in the last day, uh, you can take a look at that hashtag. And people are putting, posting videos um, of you know what they think you know they think an hour uh, you know going beyond an hour should be. Uh, so there's a lot of fun uh, 
a lot of fun stuff there. So check out Beyond One Hour. That certainly, I have it pulled up here and we'll certainly put a note on that on the show notes. Talking again to Dan Rezek from Tinker, tinker.com. You can, of course, find them on Twitter at Go Tinker. Dan, uh, I'll give you the last word here. What advice would you want to leave anybody on, you know, how do you jump in? Where do you start? What would sure. you tell anybody out there? Well, absolutely. If you're starting with, uh, you know, if you want to make computer, if you feel the urgency, first of all, <laughs> like I do, uh, because we got to get everybody prepared uh, for the for the present. Um, just go to tinker.com slash join. If you haven't joined, go ahead and join and start playing around. Have some fun. You know, there's there's so many activities there for you to just uh, share with your students. Uh, but then uh, obviously just go there and play around, add some students and um uh yeah tinker.com slash join is is the place you're going to want to go and of course you, just, you can go to hour of code too there's like a, a million things there too but uh this will really get you into the heart of what uh you know what tinker's all about certainly check it out dan i want to say thank you so much for coming on and please come back on the show to share more about the great stuff that's happening with tinker and in your neighborhood thanks jeff thanks so much for having me i appreciate it and again, thank you for taking the time to make TeacherCast part of your professional development. We hope you've enjoyed this show. And if you have an idea for your own show, please let us know. We love it when you reach out to us on Twitter at TeacherCast. Leave us a voicemail over at TeacherCast.net slash voicemail. Email us at feedback at TeacherCast.net. And of course, take a moment and subscribe to our audio and our video shows over at TeacherCast.net slash audio and TeacherCast.net. Not dot net slash video. On behalf of everybody here on the TeacherCast Educational Broadcasting Network, my name is Jeff Bradbury, reminding you to keep up the great work in your classrooms and continue sharing your passions with your students.